Hey there, friends. It's been a little while since we've been together for um, our adult Bible study. Uh, we're working our way through the life of David. Eventually, he's going to die and we'll be finished. Uh, but that's going to be it's going to be a little bit. True, true. <laughs> so um, uh, we're we're really ready, I believe, for Second Samuel twenty. But we're going to do a little bit of review because it's been a month um, since we've been able to be together um, because of my traveling and a couple other things. So <clears throat> as we've been working our way through Second Samuel, um, we have seen that uh, the prophecies that were given to David after his affair with Bathsheba um, have really started to come true. Um, the, there's been constant turmoil uh, for for David's reign, his throne. He's still on the throne, but there have been complications. There have been challenges. Um, in <clears throat> in chapter 18, we saw the death of Absalom, who tried to overthrow his father, uh, ran him out of town. He tried to take over. Uh, but, and by the end of chapter 18, he's been killed in the forest by our old friend Joab, um, who happened to be Absalom's cousin. Um, <clears throat> in chapter 19, uh, when we were together the last time, uh, Joab really kind of laid down the law for Uncle, Uncle David the king to say, uh, you need to stop weeping for your traitorous um, usurping son, uh, you're going to drive the whole army away from you if you don't knock it off. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, that that brings about David's return from where he. Oh, it's no longer in the frame. Oh, that's a shame. <clears throat> uh, so he has been. Uh, over in this area around the Jabbok River, um, that's where uh, where Absalom died, um, and then they've been making their way back. I believe they are here at the ford of the Jordan around Gilgal uh, in in chapter 19, um, which <clears throat> this has nothing to do with David, but here's what we did: we uh, we landed. Um, over here around um, Tel Aviv, uh, which I don't know exactly where that is because, you know, it's not a you know, on the biblical map. Uh, and we, um, we went up here north to Dan, um, so it may have even up this far. We ended up at the Sea of Galilee. Uh, we did our baptisms right about here along the Jordan. Um, we came down here to Ed Getty, uh, where we visited um, Masada. We came back up north um, on our way to Jerusalem, where we spent about four nights in Jerusalem before we flew back out to Athens. <clears throat> um, we did talk about Absalom's tomb, but Absalom's tomb was built probably around the 800s AD, so um, not exactly probably the same place that King or the Prince Absalom was was, was killed. <clears throat> um, very uh, it was very helpful to kind of see what all this looks like. It gives a better appreciation for <clears throat> for some of what we've said here. Uh, there are a lot more trees than I expected. And the greatest majority of trees I saw were banana trees. I didn't know there were bananas being grown in Israel, but they are by the kajillions. Acres and acres of banana plantations all over. That was bizarre. <clears throat> but I prefer dates. So, um, All right, so Absalom um, is, is dead and gone. He has been um, thrown into the pit. Uh, and that leaves David and his men to come back to Jerusalem through Gilgal. Um, there is a little bit of fighting. We love David more than you do. We deserve him more than you do. Um, um, and that's kind of how we wrap, wrap things up in the last four verses, 40 through 43. Um, 
the men of Israel are soldiers that have come from all over the tribes. Um, all the way from Dan in the north, all the way down to Simeon in the south. Um, you got you, Judah, um, which was always faithful to David, and everything else that was not exactly sure. <clears throat> um, so the men of Judah, who have perpetually been David's supporters, um, get confronted by the much larger group of the rest of Israel. Why did you take him away? Well, because he was going to get killed. And um, why are you also bringing him back? Uh, and their answer is, well, we know him best. He's our friend, not yours. Well, he's, he's an Israelite just like we are. So um, there's this kind of petty, childish conversation going back and forth about who really loves David. Uh, and so that's kind of how chapter 20 kicks off. <clears throat> Uh, in chapter 20, um, we get to see that there is continued rebellion um, still taking place in Israel against David. It is not anymore from his own house, like it was with Absalom. <coughs> uh, 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 1. Now a troublemaker named Sheba, son of Bichri, a Benjamite, happened to be there, there at the fords of the Jordan. He sounded the trumpet, uh, the, the shofar, the ram's horn, and shouted, We have no share in David, no part in Jesse's son. Every man to his tent, Israel. So all the men of Israel deserted David to follow Sheba the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah stayed by their king all the way from the Jordan to Jerusalem. When David returned to his palace in Jerusalem, I'll stop there. That, that's the different thought. Okay, so the bickering between the tribes has been going on. This man named Sheba, who is from the tribe of Benjamin. Who else is a Benjamite? So Saul is from the tribe of Benjamin. I think there's probably always going to be this idea from some of these Benjamites that they should have been the kings, not the Jude, the Jude tribe. So Sheba, who is a Benjamite, sort of takes advantage of the opportunity and says, there's all this fighting. This is an ideal time for me to try to gin up my own support here. Um, so he blows the, the shofar, the ram's horn, um, which is the signal for everybody to come together and pay attention. And uh, when they all listen to him, he says, Israel, go home. He's not our king. Why do we want to follow him? He's from Judah. All he's done is cause trouble. He's just Jesse's son from Bethlehem. He's nothing special. Uh, so, being from the former royal tribe of Benjamin, Sheba seems to believe that people should follow him. He calls them to follow after him. Um, but the men of Judah, all of those cousins, I mean, it, it really is sort of hilarious that they, they're they fighting about the fact that we're closer related to him than they are. Because it's like <laughs> two generations, 20 generations ago. So they're, they're not really any, any <clears throat> much closer to, to David than the Benjamites, not Benjamites. <clears throat> but that's the that's the deal. David is from the tribe of Judah, and so they will stick with him. Um, the word is that they clung to their king, velcroed to him. They followed him all the way from the Jordan River, all the way um, across, down the hill, across the valley, up the hill, back to um, back to Jerusalem. <clears throat> so he can reclaim his throne. Um, it hasn't been very long since he left his throne, but now he's, he's on his way back to, to get it. All right, verse 3. When David returned to his palace in Jerusalem, he took the ten concubines he had left to take care of the palace and put them in a house under guard. He provided for them but had no sexual relations with them, 
They were kept in confinement till the day of their death, living as widows. It's kind of a weird place to put that. And why? Because Absalom slept with a woman on top of the on top of the That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So David is coming back to take the throne. He's moving back into the palace. He's moving all of the the you know. All of the Absalom bumper stickers from all the backs of all the camels and the donkeys now. <clears throat> and he's setting things back right. He left these young women here to take care of the palace in his absence. Absalom decided he was just going to go ahead and claim them as his own. And so right out there in front of God and everybody, on top of the roof, where if he had a party, um, I'm sure the wine was flowing and um, it was... Um, it was a, dis a definite slap in his father's face. These are mine now. I am claiming them. Here's the thing. Absalom is now dead. The last person who was intimate with them, the one who had claimed them, is gone. So there's nobody to take care of them. And because they had been married to the king, Nobody else can marry them. They are widows. David is not going to take them back because as sketchy as his morals are occasionally, um, you know, you're not supposed to, to sleep with the wives of your family members. That's gross and wrong, according to God's law and anybody who has any common sense. <clears throat> so, I think with some amount of compassion David says all right ladies I'm moving you over here this is your home I will provide for you clothing food whatever you need you will be taken care of until the day you die they would never marry they would never have children they would they would always be under the king's care and protection um, the first time you read through that, you might go, well, that's, that's kind of weird, and it seems a little harsh, like, these sweet young things are destined to grow old together, locked up in this house. I think David is probably being more gracious than, than anybody else would have been at, at that point, certainly more than Absalom never was. <clears throat> did they have no choice when Absalom said this is what he wanted? I bet they did not. I bet they did not either. <clears throat> and and maybe that's yet why they're held accountable. Well, I don't know if they're held accountable or if they're just held as tainted. <laughs> That's kind of the idea, but that seems like a meaner word that I might have come up for. They've been, they've been, they're, they're David's goods. But they, they would know that too. So they yeah. would know that that's what they probably should do anyway. David just made it easier. Maybe. Maybe. <clears throat> it's hard to know without being part of that culture. Really He's putting different. away the distractions too. It's a, it is a, it's a weird little verse right there in the middle of everything. But it is there to show that he is in control. He is taking back control of the throne, of the palace, of his home, of the nation, and he is going to set right everything that his idiot son screwed up. He'll even take care of these women that he destroyed, I suppose. <clears throat> I'm sort of glad Shirley's not here because I don't think she would like this one bit. She doesn't like David at all. Not anyway. as pretty hard anyway, yeah. <laughs> Verse 4. Then the king said to Amasa, Summon the men of Judah to come to me within three days and be here yourself. But when Amasa went to summon Judah, he took longer than the time the king had sent for him. David said to Abishai, 
Now, Sheba, son of Bichri, will do us more harm than Absalom did. Take your master's men and pursue him, or he will find fortified cities and escape from us. So Joab's men and the Carathites and Pelathites and all the mighty warriors went out under the control of Abishai. They marched out from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, son of Bichri. Okay. Amasa is who? You remember from a couple chapters ago, Amasa had been a commander for Absalom. Wasn't he the spy or wasn't the guy that was supposed to misinterpret what he said? Uh, there's um, another guy. Okay. He's, he's, rel he's a relative of David and Absalom. He was placed in charge uh, of the army. Um, by by David was kind of a surprising move because um, Joab was off doing his own thing again, being being too harsh. <clears throat> and so um, Amasa has been uh, has been called by the king to go after this rabble rouser, this Sheba, who is trying to gin up enough support to make a play for the throne himself. Round up the troops, be here in three days. Well, Masa doesn't get around to it. It takes him a little longer than that. Don't know why. Um, some people feel like maybe he was trying to go to places like Benjamin and other tribes to get more support uh, when he probably just needed to grab the men from Judah. <clears throat> David doesn't like how long it's taking. And so he says to a different nephew, he says to Abishai, who is Joab's brother, who has always been a military commander, you take you take all Joab's men. You take the Carathites and the Pelophites. They're like the special guard of David. They've been with him for years, um, faithfully serving him. Um, they, they may have Philistine roots in some way, but they, they sort of latched onto David and they are super faithful to him. Um, probably kind of like, um, what's the word that I just had, which is now gone, when you pay somebody to be a soldier for you. Thank you. There was no, no, none of those were the right letters I had. Um, so mercenaries, paid, paid soldiers. Um, plus, you've also got he's talking about the the mighty men, the the warriors. So like that list of thirty or thirty five men that we've talked about before, who are super elite, hard, battle weary, battle worn time-tested soldiers. So David says, I want you to take all of them, Abishai, and go get this guy, because if we don't deal with him, he's going to end up being worse than Absalom was for us. So David has, in effect, said, I want you to take anybody who can protect me and Judah and the throne and the city. I want you to take them all, hunt this guy down which would show us how big of a deal David believes this Sheba is. He's left himself totally unprotected. Okay. So why didn't he react when they were at the fords when he first came out? That's a great question. Hmm. Let me just lop off his head there and then and be done with it. Maybe he figured everybody was <laughs> too too tired from what they'd already been through. Maybe he was that way. He may not have known who, was, who, who would, might have been loyal to him either. True. That early on. <clears throat> maybe, maybe everybody had kind of gone their own ways when he looked around and realized that 11 twelfths of the army was now gone. So. All right, verse eight. While they were at the great rock in Gibeon, 
right here above the B in Benjamin. Okay, so they've left Jerusalem. They, they've gone just a little, a little farther north. Uh, while they were at the Great Rock in Gibeon, that's now all of, of Abishai's troops, all of these special forces, secret service, battle guard, everything. Um, while they were at the Great Rock in Gibeon, Amasa came to meet them. Joab is there because his brother is leading the group and he's with his men. Joab was wearing his military tunic and strapped over it at his waist was a belt with a dagger in its sheath. As he stepped forward, it dropped out of its sheath. Joab said to Amasa, how are you, my brother? Then Joab took Amasa by the beard uh, with his right hand to kiss him. Amasa was not on his guard against the dagger in Joab's hand, and Joab plunged it into his belly, and his intestines spilled out on the ground. Without being stabbed again, Amasa died. Then Joab and his brother Abishai <coughs> pursued Sheba, son of Bichri. He is very intense. He, I, I believe he is a PTSD loose cannon time bomb ready to shoot at whatever pops his head up. <clears throat> it is. But it were is, they unsure of Amasa's loyalties because of where he came from? Well, he was late. Well, he was late, yeah. But. He's a slacker. <clears throat> Just kind of whenever he got around to it. Plus, if Amasa really had been Absalom's military leader, which I believe that's what the text tells us, then he's got a little bit of an axe to grind. One thing about it, Joab, for as whack job as he is, he is intensely loyal to David. He will take care of things for David when David won't take care of David. I, I think that Joab sees that Amasa can't be trusted. He's made bad choices in the past, probably going to make them in the future. And so, out he goes. How did it work? Not exactly sure. So he's got his military stuff on. He has a belt with a dagger in it. The dagger falls out of its sheath onto the ground, probably. As Amasa is approaching Joab, it, it falls out onto the ground. Joab leans over to pick it up. He grabs it with his left hand while he is grabbing for his cousin's face with his right hand to kiss his beard, which is a greeting. Hey, brother, great to see you. Pulls him in close and one, one big slash and Amasa is gonna bleed out on the ground on the road. <clears throat> uh, and the problem is that Amasa, although he dies, he apparently dies sort of a slow, painful, kind of humiliating death laying there in the road. Uh, with his intestines spilled out with, on the road? With his... That took a while? Inward parts on the outward part. <clears throat> Which, you know, now that he's out of the way, Joab and Abishai and the rest of the guys are off to go find Sheba and hunt him down. Um, <clears throat> we should read verse, um, start verse 11. One of Joab's men stood beside Amasa, bleeding out on the road and said, whoever favors Joab and whoever is for David, let him follow Joab. So Amasa lay wallowing in his blood in the middle of the road, and the man saw that all the troops came to a halt there. You would when your commanding officer had been slashed. When he realized that everyone came, who came up to Amasa stopped, he dragged him from the road into a field and threw a garment over him. After Amasa had been removed from the road, everyone went on with Joab to pursue Sheba, son of Bichri. Not a distinguished burial. <clears throat> 
Let's drag this guy out of the road. Maybe he's dead. Maybe he's not all the way dead, but they drag him off to the ditch. They throw a, a robe over him, kick some dirt onto the bloody spot in the middle of the road, and everybody just goes on like they're supposed to. As we caissons come rolling along. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I do not want to go on vacation with Joab. He's, he is a violent, violent man. All right, verse 14. <coughs> uh, Sheba passed through all the tribes of Israel to Abel Beth Maaka, and through the entire region of the Bichrites, who gathered together and followed him. All the troops with Joab came and besieged Sheba in Abel Beth Maaka. They built a siege ramp up to the city, and it stood against the outer fortifications. While they were battering the wall to bring it down, a wise lady, a wise woman, called from the city, Listen, listen, tell Joab to come here so I can speak to him. He went toward her and she asked, are you Joab? Okay, so um, is, uh, is it on here anywhere? No. Okay, so uh, when I was studying the map earlier, uh, don't quote me on this, but I believe it's right that um, this city, Abel Beth Maaka, is up all the way up here. Um, so they've, they've traveled quite a ways, at least, what's that, 60, 70 miles, um, that they've, they've gone to find this Sheba who has held himself up in this little fortified city. <clears throat> um, and I, I, I won't assume that you know what a siege ramp is. So, so when you have you have your city, okay. <clears throat> when when people want to come and invade, um, if they can't bust the door down, then then they they start throwing stuff on a ramp so they can just hop over the top of the wall. So everybody in the city has plenty of time to know they're coming. Yeah, and and this doesn't happen in a minute right? or a week or, or a month. If you're building a ramp big enough to move soldiers and horses and whatever else on this ramp for a city wall that might be 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet high, um, it's going to take weeks or months. Um, we, we visited Masada two weeks ago, and the Romans built a siege ramp to get into Masada. Masada is on the top of this, this giant mesa. There's one little squirrely track that goes up the side that it's impossible for anybody to follow. So the Romans took three years to build a siege ramp up. And the night before they were gonna come over the top, that's when all the inhabitants of Masada killed themselves. They killed their families and then they killed themselves. It took three years to build it. And you just watch it, they're getting closer and closer. The same thing is, is happening here in Abel Beth Maaka. You know, the, all the inhabitants of this little city know that it's Joab, and he's crazy. He's going to come in here, and he's going to kill us all. So this very wise woman, don't tell me that God hates women, because there's lots of instances where there's really amazing women who do amazing things. This wise woman comes to the top and says, says to Joab, Hey, um, why are you here? What can we do for you? Is there any way we can get you to stop trying to come in here to knock our walls down? Why are you here? That's the Sarah's translation. 
Um, are you Joab? I am, he answered. She said, listen to what your servant has to say. He said, I'm listening. She continued, long ago they used to say, get your answer at Abel. And that settled it. We are the peaceful and the faithful in Israel. You are trying to destroy a city that is a mother in Israel. Why do you want to swallow up the Lord's inheritance? Joab replied, far be it from me, far be it from me to swallow up or destroy. That is not the case. A man named Sheba, son of Bichri, from the hill country of Ephraim, has lifted up his hand against the king, against David. Hand over this man, hand over this one man, and I'll withdraw from the city. That's a pretty good deal. We won't knock your walls down if you give us the one guy we're looking for. Save yourselves. The woman said to Joab, his head will be thrown over the wall <laughs> to you. Then the woman went to all the people with her wise advice, and they cut off the head of Sheba, son of Bichri, and threw it to Joab. So Joab sounded the trumpet, and his men dispersed from the city, each returning to his home. And Joab went back to the king in Jerusalem. Okay. Seems like a good trade. We will, uh, tell you what, you, you give us this one man, we'll go home, we'll pretend like this never happened. Because, she says, this, this is a good city. It's peaceful. It's faithful. Um, it's, it's a part of the inheritance that, that God gave to Israel. Why would you want to knock down our city? Why would you want to knock down our walls? This isn't some Ammonite city or an Amalekite city. This is an Israelite city. Please don't destroy us. What do you really want? Well, we want, we want him. And her answer is, hang on just a minute. I know, I know right where to get that. <clears throat> and so, um, yes, it is north of the Sea of Galilee. Um, the traitor is killed. The negotiator throws the head over the wall. Joab gives the trumpet blast. Everybody turns around, puts down their shovels, picks up their tents, and they head back to Jerusalem. And I think it's interesting specifically that they say, and Joab went back to the king in Jerusalem. Okay. He's the big hero now. He has, he has chased down the infidel. He has rooted out the traitor. He's been executed. And so Joab will come back as the big hero. Back, back in the graces of his. And then the, the last little bit of chapter 20 is kind of a recap We've, we've already seen something like this about 12 chapters ago, uh, but it's a list of David's officials. Um, so we get to see David's cabinet, his administration um, in verses 23 to 26. Um, you can also find it in 1 Chronicles 18. It's a little different. Uh, the timing is not exactly the same, but it's close. Uh, so it says, Joab was over Israel's entire army. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was over the Carathites and Pelethites. Adoniram was in charge of forced labor. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahitud, was recorder. Shiva was secretary. Zadok and Abiathar were priests. And Ira the Jerite was David's priest. Uh, so... Who's doing what? Well, Joab is back to being the commander of all of Israel's armed forces. He is the five-star general, chairman of the Joint Chiefs. You know, he's he's the military pinnacle. Answering only to David, and not very often, actually, was the answer to David. Um, then we read about Benaiah, son of Jehoiada. He is the commander of the Carathites and Pelophites, uh, kind of like the, the Secret Service, the, uh, the mercenaries. 
Uh, we read about him back in 2 Samuel 8. He is the guy who chased the lion into a pit on a snowy day and killed him. So he's, he's pretty bold. Adoniram is the secretary of labor, prisoners of war, people who are not being paid for their work. Um, we read about him a, a little bit later as well. Jehoshaphat is called the recorder. Uh, this position is kind of like the, well, it is May the 4th be with you day. So he is, uh, he is C3PO. He is in charge of protocol. Um, he speaks the languages. Um, he makes the connections between the king and visiting dignitaries. If you want an audience with the king, uh, you're going to go to him. So probably sort of like a, yeah, he's, you, you got to go through him. He's going to make sure it gets handled the right way. Um, it could be, you know, because he's the recorder, he might be doing some biography or some chronicling of, of David's reign as well. Um, <clears throat> then there's Shiva, not Shiva, Shiva uh, in First Chronicles 18, it's called Shavsa. He's the secretary. Um, his job has to do with counting and enumerating. Um, one of the, the discussions or the descriptions is that he is in charge of correspondence, um, sending letters, putting out edicts, etc. Then there's a couple names we recognize, Zadok and Abiathar, um, or Abimelech, the son of Abiathar. They are referred to as the priests of Israel. They are serving around the ark. They are leading the nation in worship, um, taking care of sacrifices, um, just like we would expect. Uh, it is a little unclear that Zadok's name is the same in all the places. But it's either Abiathar or Abimelech, um, kind of used interchangeably. If um, if Abimelech is Abiathar's son, it could be that just Abiathar is is working along with his father. It's not necessarily wrong. It's just a little more detail. And then um, the last name there, Ira, um, is called David's priest. In the Chronicles passage that gives this list, um, the, the word there is that David's sons are called um, like chief priests or priests to the king. Um, it's not clear that, that Ira the Jerite is a Levite. Um, but he, he might be serving more as like a personal spiritual advisor, um, a spiritual counselor, maybe more in the idea of serving as a, like a minister in government as opposed to a priest. Um, David's sons had had a similar role where they were giving advice to, to their father in his reign. And that's the end of chapter 20. Kind of bloody, sort of a little, a little disappointing, I think, because Joab is doing his thing. But any uh, any great insight, any any deep thoughts that you've had while we've been talking? Joab kind of takes over the army of Abishai. Yeah. Well, he is the older brother, so Abishai is probably the middle brother, so he's just going to get walked all over all the time. <clears throat> Joab is not limited by really anything. He just really does whatever he wants to do. I do believe that it's because he believes it's what's best for David and for the nation even when it's not.
Uh, thankfully, I believe we're very not very many chapters away from the end of Joab. So, what are you working on, Cody? Nothing. Are you sure? Any questions or deep thoughts or major revelations? It almost seems like there was a lot of scattered stuff that happened <clears throat> during the chase of Absalom and going through all that. Some people just didn't do what they were supposed to do. And David gets back in Jerusalem and sends it out and it all gets cleaned up. That's kind of what it feels like. I'd say that is probably a reasonably accurate assessment. There is chaos. There is a lot of chaos going on. Since, really, since whatever chapter that was where Amnon raped his half-sister, Absalom's full sister, that was kind of like the, the beginning of all of the badness. Um, and there's... All, it's just kind of swirling every place. That's what the consequences of sin do. They they sort of spin up and they never really spin all the way away. There's always unintended consequences of the sin that is hidden. Um, or once it is found out, the sin that's confessed and repented of, there's still consequences of it. All of this stuff that we're seeing here is a consequence of David's infidelity to his wife um, and, um, and, to, and to God as well. Um, David is coming to the end of his reign. Um, hopefully we'll see here that David is able to pull more more things back together again before his before the day of his death <clears throat> but so far there hasn't been anybody who really seems like a great successor to David wasn't going to be Amnon because he was controlled by his lust wasn't going to be Absalom because he was controlled by his own pride and arrogance. So, gosh, I wonder who it'll be who will <laughs> rise to the top. So, spoiler alert. <clears throat> well, they say the cream rises to the top, but so do the flies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Um, well, that will will cover things for this evening. When we get together next week, we'll pick up here. Uh, we'll probably go a little longer and a little a little harder. Um, I I would like to see how much of David we can get handled before we stop for the summer. My plan is to go through the end of May with our Thursday group. So, um, depending on where we are. We may throw an extra week or two on there, but um, it will be hard to do it during vacation Bible school, which is the first weekend in June. So, because this will be something else that week. Castles and drawbridges or something, I think. Dragons. Okay. <clears throat> My voice is very tired. I, it has not recovered from the trip. I had this little scratchy thing going the whole time we were gone. I had hoped that when I got back to to Mom, home, whatever Mom that it, it would it would feel right, and it still feels kind of good. So, I'll touch that. All right, uh, let me turn this off. Don't forget, you can always go back and watch it again for anything you missed. Um, if you got questions. Send me a note, james.sayers at roychristian.org. Bye. So this is 